let's put it this way. You, you describe yourself as being interested in navigating, correctly navigating issues of what we might otherwise call diversity, equity, and inclusion without involved in, in without getting involved in what we recognize as the culture war. Mm -hmm. You are not absolutely alone in this quadrant. You right. are, uh, you are friends with Chloe Valdery, so she's mm -hmm. a mutual friend of ours. And I would say that you are both interested in figuring out, you know, sorting the wheat from the chaff in this area, rather than just pretending that there is no issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Uh, and, you know, I, I share that belief with you. There is something to be navigated, and unfortunately, both polls are wrong about it. It's not that we don't have a problem. Right, but it is also not that you know white supremacy is uh, ubiquitous in in America and the West, and it has to be stamped out along with patriarchy, and and all of those uh, false uh, assertions. I, I have to, yeah. Well, I, you know, uh, this um, the constant refrain of white supremacy. Um, <laughs> It's so sad for all kinds of reasons, but one of the big reasons for me is that. Uh, first of all, you know, my family are refugees from Uganda in East Africa. We were booted out by a black man, Idi Amin, who decided that Africa belongs only to blacks. Um, well, guess what, folks? Uh, my family had been in Uganda for three generations. Uh, we did not know any other country. We did not have a passport to India or a passport to Britain. Uganda was our country. Um, but, you know, the, the, the very legitimate aspiration to liberation in the various African colonies devolved, as aspirations often do, into a fever called Pan-Africanism. And that is when you get the dogma. And dogma, by definition, is exclusionary. So no wonder that you know, uh, a military dictator could tell other people of color, you do not belong here. And part of what is so frustrating for somebody who has been born in a completely different uh, segment of the world, coming to the United States, is that even those who decry Western imperialism or who uh, you know, castigate um, others for, quote, centering whiteness, they themselves don't recognize that these impulses to exclude are human. They are endemically human. And that if you're going to go around preaching to others to check their bias, the question becomes, what bias of yours are you checking? Role model that. Show that. And that's, again, not what we see. So in a way, Brett, I feel like this whole uh, cultural moment, uh, sort of focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and the like, is missing something huge, a huge opportunity. And the opportunity is this. Right now, it's as if there are two rival teams on the field. One used to wear the jersey called Powerful, and the other used to wear the uniform uh, labeled powerless. Now those jerseys are being swipe, uh, swapped out. Okay. They're being traded, but you have the same game. We have the opportunity right now to change the us against them game through diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that is not what we are doing. We're replicating the game. Right. We are replicating the game. It's not as if this isn't a known pattern. I mean, I sort of right. feel like there are places where the right lesson is encoded, right? There are things you will find in Orwell that are absolutely central to our moment. You know, the who covered this particular one, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And the idea is we have this tendency to valorize the oppressed, which is understandable. But the problem is, your point is exactly right. There is a quadrant of human nature that acts in a particular way based on its opportunities once it gains power. 
And so to the extent that we view the oppressed as more deserving, they may be more deserving, but at the point that you transfer who's powerful to them, they behave in the same ways, because guess what? This had nothing to do with their particular genes creating particular defects of cognition. This has to do with game theory. The powerful tend to behave this way unless you build systems in which it doesn't pay. If you build those systems, we can behave much better. And many of us have seen that world. We have lived in these circumstances where, frankly, race has been sidelined, and we've seen how well it works. And it's very frustrating to have the functional world that we might live in prototyped all around the landscape. But when it comes time to say, actually, here's how we ought to structure things so that race is not a dominant predictor of your well-being, for example, we end up shouted down by those who are playing a game that whether they are cynical, the game is cynical, right? Yes, it is about exactly. leveraging power in order to get limited resources, you know, making hay while the sun shines. And this is, you know, this was a disaster 100 years ago, but it's actually an existential threat now because if you play that game in a world where people are as thoroughly armed as they are and in which these tendencies are so amplified by technologies that we did not evolve with, this is going to result in a, this being a very short ride. So we have a limited amount of time to fix this. It's not like you know we can go through another couple genocides and uh, then figure it out. Actually, the time is now. Right. Right. Um, it's so interesting. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you just said about how, uh, you know, we've we've seen where this can lead. Right. Um, I have a very good friend who wrote a fantastic piece about the resegregation that is happening in various schools across the country to to kids you know, third and fourth graders being um, sort of uh, uh, divided up, physically divided up uh, in sort of the white quadrant, the, you know, black quadrant, the BIPOC uh, quadrant, et cetera, et cetera. And um, one of the people who advocates this kind of thing is, was the bridesmaid to the friend who wrote about, who wrote scathingly about this. And when my friend saw that her former bridesmaid was on board with this divvying up of kids, she asked her former bridesmaid, what gives, what happened? And the educator who, you know, advocates this kind of uh, resegregation said, well, I'm proud to be working at a school that is willing to try new things. <laughs> to try old things, really. To try old. <laughs> it, how does it not occur to her that we did try this and it was bad? How does an educator not realize that this is not a new thing? It's an old thing. Yes. I, tell me how that happens, Brett. Well, I, I wish I knew. And, you know, of course, I... Um rather famously lived this exact phenomenon as I watched my college embrace segregation. I did the obvious thing, which was to point out that this wasn't a good idea. And I became, you know, the sort of symbol for white supremacy on my campus because I was against segregation. I mean, that that is such a bizarre uh, experience to go through, right? If you had told me at 35 that that was going to happen to me, you know, uh, on the cusp of 50, right? That I was going to be demonized as a racist for fighting segregation. I would have thought you completely bonkers, right? Likewise, if you had told me 10 years ago that we would be having a fight over whether or not there was a sexual binary that was uh, supported by scientific evidence. I mean, this couldn't possibly be a more secure conclusion it has nothing to do with humans. It goes back 500 million years in our lineage alone, right? How could we possibly find ourselves fighting over that? Or the idea that in mathematics, we would be fighting over whether or not two plus two indeed equals four in some yeah. fundamental way. Like, how did we allow the very basic rules for memory or extrapolation to be taken from us? So now let me ask a kind of a provocative question, okay, to the both of us. 
and I myself don't yet have an answer by uh, literally because the question is this, what are we missing? What are you and I not getting that so many others get? I'd really, <clears throat> I'm very open yeah. to exploring this. Well, so let me say, I, I want to be careful because I feel like there are certain things that we could say almost for sure, okay? We're missing 90% of the story, you and me. Okay. Or that, that's because we're doing well, right? The fact that it, you know, we might be getting 10% of it is, is uh, par for the course, actually. That doesn't mean that the object that sounds like the one you're describing actually exists, because I don't think we are missing it. I think the point is we have been invited to a game that were we to say, you know what, we're probably powerless to stop the game, so we might as well play to win, right? If you wanted to win the diversity, equity, and inclusion game so that at the point that it collapses, which I would argue is absolutely inevitable, when that game collapses, you know, you could have three homes maybe if you played your cards right, right? Um, and so the question is not what are we missing, the question is, why would we fail to play the game when the alternative is to effectively play Cassandra and to warn of something that's coming and have it not create the impact that could prevent it? Well, in, in part, I know why I refuse to play by the rules of the game. Um, one of the reasons, there are many, but one of the reasons I refuse to play by the rules is that, um, as I mentioned, you know, my family and I are refugees to this part of the world. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt that it has been uh, our good fortune to wind up here. Um, every morning before I pull my sorry butt out of bed, I thank uh, God, I am a person of faith. Uh, I thank God that, you know, we wound up in a part of the world where as somebody with all of my labels, um, as somebody who nonetheless has been given the opportunities and has recognized them as opportunities and has taken the opportunities to develop a voice and to become something of a thought leader. Um, I, I really believe, Brett, that most people in our society have those opportunities. I see how you know, students of color, for example, in uh, urban centers where I've, I've taught um, are being pumped with the narrative that not only are they victims, but now, quite apart from their uh, skin color, now they are also, along with white kids, fragile. So that even being exposed to a different perspective, one that challenges the narrative that they're being you know, filled with, is harming them. And a lot of these kids actually don't feel harmed, but they're thinking to themselves, well, if I'm supposed to be harmed, then I guess I better act that way because that's what's expected of me. So we're creating these false uh, divisions and, um, and tensions. Uh, and for what? For the adults to uh, build stature upon this pile of falsifications.